Um, good evening and welcome to our board meeting. If you will just bear with us for just a minute, we have a few things that we're trying to get in place so that we can have some board members um, logged in and take care of a few minutes, uh, last uh, minute things, a few last minute things. Welcome. I'm sorry I didn't have my mic on earlier when we were asking for just a minute um, to get situated. Um, welcome and good evening. I'd like to call on board member Linda Welburn to open our meeting this evening. Okay. If, if you will please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And it, it will have a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Hello? Is that one of the board members uh, that's calling in? Must be Diane over here. Diane, yeah. are you here? I am. All right, so Diane. Is okay, going. if she can mute herself until you got her. Okay, thank you. So we have Diane Bellamy Smalls on the phone, and I believe Pat Tillman is on duty and will try to join us at some point during the meeting. We are now um, at um, our public comments have been emailed to the Board um, of Education, and they can continue to do so um, as we've discussed tonight our reopening. We are now at approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Betty? Second. I'm sorry. Where's Betty going to do that? <laughs> Madam Chair? Yes. I would like to add to the agenda on reconsideration for Policy DC on budget and physical management as action item D. So you would like to amend the agenda to for a motion to reconsider uh, policy DC. All right, is there a second? A second. All right, um, all those in favor, please vote using your electronic voting mechanism. Yes. Um, Diane, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. All right, the ag agenda has been amended and we will discuss policy DC item D under action items. Is that what you were saying, Betty? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, we are now at the consent agenda. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. I just looked out right over that. Look to board member uh, Anita Sharp for a motion. I'm sorry. Closed session? Oh, do you have the motion? Yeah. Anita, can you turn your mic on? I move we go into closed session to preserve the attorney-client privilege and to uh, discuss personnel matters protected by state law. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, Diane, how do you vote? She can't hear. Sorry, Diane, how do you vote? Yes. <laughs> Thank you.
consent agenda. Dr. Contreras. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. This evening's consent agenda includes several items. Those are the personnel report and addendum to the personnel report, the 2021-2022 insurance coverage, designation of official dis depositories and appointment of school treasurers for 2021-2022, and a contractual agreement with Salient Health for Speech Language Services. That concludes this evening's consent agenda for your consideration. Make a motion that we accept the consent agenda. Second. Second. Um, all those in favor, please uh, vote electronically. All those in favor, please vote electronically. I don't know if she is she on the phone, Lisa. She still hasn't responded. Okay. All right, that passes by a vote of six to one. Thank you. We are now at. I have to name the appointment. I'm sorry. Thank okay. you, Dr. Contreras. Thank you. Uh, this evening, that includes the appointment of the Chief Student Services Officer, Mr. Dominique Robinson, the School Support Officer, Mr. Michael Hedenbach, uh, another School Support Officer, Dr. Angela Draper, the Senior ED of Federal Programs and Special Programs, Melissa Nixon. Principal of the Newcomer School in High Point, Christian Walter. Principal of Irwin Montessori, Melena Seegers. Principal of Pierce Elementary, Michelle Sandra. And we have several principals that we have not appointed their school yet. We will do so in the next week after meeting with site-based teams. Kendrick Alston, Winnellyn Bell Glenn, Allison Bennett, Monique Curry, Ashley Garcia, Tiffany Ingram, Melinda Mayhew, Angela Monell and Chandra Norman Rogers. Congratulations to all of you. There's Diane. I think she just came on. Uh, okay. So Diane has joined us. Diane, is that you on the line? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Welcome. I'm trying to, um... Congratulations to um, those that Dr. Contreras named on our personnel report. I um, have a few comments tonight. While I usually take this time to share good news with the community, I have two critical issues that I need to address this evening. Uh, and I'll just um, talk about these in two parts because I think I want to take care of one section at a time. Uh, Dr. Carr, as I'll be calling you, you want um, to discuss the protocols we'll use for in-person attendance at our board meetings, hopefully starting next month. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to you to highlight those as we ask you to come back with recommendations. After, okay, I'm good. Okay, so after <laughs> reviewing the uh, most recent uh, toolkit that was issued in guidance from the N North Carolina Division of Health and Human Services, as well as the other, um, the CDC and other things that we looked at, I've got the following recommendations. So regarding in-person attendance and seating, Face coverings or masks will still be required except when speaking publicly or obviously taking a drink, water. Uh, meeting speakers and adult attendees would be screened at building entry. Seating would be first come, first serve, except for seats reserved for those being recognized by the board, as well as the seats recognized uh, reserved for the staff. Meeting attendees, including reporters, would be allowed into the boardroom one at a time to meet the state's physical distancing recommendations for public school facilities. There would be approximately three feet of physical distance between seats. All chairs would be facing in the same direction, so that takes out some of our side seating. Um, to provide more seating for members of the public, in-person attendance at meetings by employees will be limited to executive leadership uh, staff, the chiefs, and our director of communications. Employees, other employees will be encouraged to view the meeting live, that is live streamed on YouTube, GCS TV, and the district's website. We anticipate that we will be able to sit about 15 individuals in addition to the board, staff and the media um, at one time. 
if somebody leaves, we will allow another person in when that person leaves. So we'd let them in one at a time. Um, as per our usual process, public speakers would sign up in it person or may call to sign up until 5 p.m. the day of the meeting. Due to the need to screen speakers and maintain the appropriate phys physical distance, we'll not sign up speakers after 5 p.m. As you know, we historically have allowed people to sign up as right before the meeting starts. However, as is always the case, individuals can submit their comments via email at boardofed at gcsnc.com. We'll continue to do that. If someone can't get in to speak, they can still submit comments. And as you all know, as we've been doing throughout the pandemic, we post those comments uh, with board materials. Um, and if they come in after the meeting, we post them at the next meeting. Public speakers will continue to be called in the order in which the requests were received. We're anticipating that public speakers and people that want to sit and listen to the meeting might be different, so we'll, we'll arrange, um, arrange for that. Um, we will escort people in one at a time to do the public speaking and then leave the room so we don't uh, violate sort of the meeting protocols in terms of the number of people that can be in the room at one time and social distance in public school uh, guidance. In keeping with the uh, State Department protocols, oh, I said that already. Um, let's see. The comments after the deadline will be continue to be shared with the board and will be posted online. So that's our overview. Um, there will be more details for staff in terms of how to man the doors and conduct the screenings. Um, and we'll have people at both entrances so that we can at both the front door and then the side door and we'll communicate all of those guidelines if uh, approved by the Board of Education. A uh, question in regard to allowing people to come in one at a time, where will people be allowed to be uh, in that seating area or they have they to, have to be outside. outside we can take three or four people in the seating area but after that we don't we can't you know how normally our halls are congested everything's all congested we can't do that and meet the current um, protocols and guidelines from the health department uh, the other question is um, I would like to recommend that we set a time limit for public comment? Oh, thank you. Yes, in fact, I meant to recommend that as well. Um, our recommendation or my recommendation is that we follow the county commissioners and do 30 minute public comment um, period. If the board chooses, you can always extend it longer or come back and do it after the business meeting, which they've chosen to do. But uh, we really want to we think we should keep it to the 30 minutes. Thank you. you. Hold on, Linda, and, Jill. And board members, that way, your practice, if you recall, used to be, and I say used to be because COVID's thrown everything up in the air and we don't remember what we used to do, but it used to be that if you went beyond the 30 minutes, the board could vote if there's one left to hear them or they could um, do the protocol, which is to move them to the end of the meeting if anybody um, right. wanted to stay and be heard. Right. But certainly everybody can email their comments in and have those posted, and the board has access to all of those as well. So um, anything that goes to the board of ed at gcsnc.com, you all receive a copy. Yes, ma'am? There's uh, been... Hold on, hold on, Anita. Oh, we have Linda. She said yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Are we allowing the three minute for per speaker still? Or yes, right, we so would still be... do three minutes per speaker. Okay. And um, you're saying we would, there would be no public speakers inside the building. They would no, come we'd in. just walk them in. Well, they walk, walk from there out. and come mm -hmm. in, and we'll have them lined up, maybe one at the door to Outside switch out. And somebody at the door. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we're allowing about 15 people inside? Yes. Okay. Now, I've got a sense. I don't like the way we're doing public comments via email. It's very confusing. When it's policy, they're told to go to GCS comments at uh, gcs.com. When it's general comments, then they're supposed to say public comment and send it to all the board. Or that's what I've been told. For me, this is we should have one way of doing it, and and Lisa should be able to sort where it belongs based on the content of the information because half of them don't know the difference between 
you know, policy versus public comment. So it's, it's just very confusing. I just want it published one way that you send it and it's a public comment and then sort it. Because I think some people, I, I, I had to, they would send it to the full board and I would send, appreciate your voice. If you would like this as a public comment, please send to GCS, blah, blah, blah. And I don't know how many of those I did, all right? So it's just confusing. And, I, and we gotta do it a better way. One, one email for everything and somehow sort through the emails because you can't like split it like that because they're not paying attention. Or if they send it to the whole board and it's addressing an issue, well, clearly that's a public comment they're trying to make in my view. If it's on the subject matter that we've been talking about, it shouldn't even have to say public comment. So other than that, I'm, I'm great with letting 15 people in. I'm great with the 30 minutes. I'm great with you know walking them in. And I think that's a very good plan. Thank you. Anita and Ken. That's exactly what I was going to address because numerous people, and I called Lisa about it, simply said submit comments one way, and we were saying submit comments the other way. And I was doing basically, without discussing it with Linda, I was basically doing what she was doing, uh, just saying send it everywhere if you want it to count. So I think. We yeah, need to I, I hear what you're saying. I simplify. think the history of that is that some people wanted to send something to the board, but didn't necessarily wanted it want it entered into the public record in terms of um, comments that are posted on the website and shared. But um, we can certainly make those adjustments. Well, they're public record anyway. We know that, right. but yeah. not everybody does. But we can make that clear, and we can have one way of it coming in. At least already does that sorting anyway because things do come in all different ways. Okay, thank you. And they will continue to come in all different ways. It's somewhat the nature of the beast. It's someone else. Yeah, Winston. Okay. Kim, Kim said never mind, she was good. A um, couple questions that I have. Um, 15 people coming in. How are those 15 selected? I mean, is that first come, first serve? It's all or? gonna be first come, first serve. So. I'm interested in the REI sale model, where you come and um, you get your name in the lottery, and then they draw people out mm -hmm. of the lottery, and, and you know it's it's more random who gets in first. So just because you have the ability to get here early in the day and sit outside, you get first into the meeting, is concerning to me. So I mean, people may not go to the REI yard sale, but I do, and. So people get there at six in the morning and they get a number and then you get there at nine o'clock, but it all goes in and then there's a lottery and 15 people win the lottery. You know, they, they go in in that order. So it, it seems to me um, could be a way to increase access. You know, we have limited seats, a more randomized way that people are able to view the meeting than just the person, the, whoever gets here all the time on time. And I'm, I'd be interested in that I'm also recognizing this like we, they got to have their names in by 5 p.m. or to be screened I mean maybe that should be 4 p.m. I'm a little worried about an hour turnaround time for staff mm -hmm. especially if we're doing a lottery or people need to be you know they're gonna be out there it's like you got to come and see if your numbers called but um, I am I am does it we could Thank you. We could call them back. I would think it would have to be by 4 p.m. so that they don't travel all the way here. Um, it, I was thinking noon, Superintendent. I don't think realistically somebody at work can get notice. I think if you don't do it by noon, you're not going to have enough okay. turnaround time. What, that, you, that you're speaking? And it's not I, I'm not talking about speakers. I'm talking about being able to be yeah, in the, the building. These the are two different things. things. Okay, well, that wasn't clear. Right, speakers? Uh, that wasn't clear to me. Either. Okay, so speakers are different. You sign up. So maybe I was confusing that you had to be screened to get in. So speakers are different. Okay. They would still have to be screened, but so, we would. But people entering right. the building, what does it mean screening? So this, I'm talking about the, and I get that somebody could be in the seat and be a speaker. Okay. That could happen. All right. I'm but sure. mostly you could speak and leave, right? Right. Is that what Correct. I'm hearing? And right. that's what most, okay, the, some that. of the districts that are, are either ha have already moved this way or are moving right. this way. Um, mm -hmm. And everybody's doing something slightly differently, but they, they, they have a separate sort of entrance for the public speakers. They take them in the order received, which is similar to our 
regular process. And how the commissioners do that. Right. And then they they <laughs> just bring them in one at a time and then take them right back to out speak. and they can leave. I guess what mm -hmm. I'm interested in is the, the 15 people who get to be in the room for the whole meeting, as mm -hmm. long, I mean, they might leave and we might bring, that could that be a lottery as opposed to first come, first serve? And, it, and how would you implement? I mean, you may have to say, "Here's how we would implement it." Like they're going to email in, or they're going to show up. To the board up. clerk, the I don't board know. clerk does a lottery, right? Or it could and be, they, you know, I mean, if if thirty people are standing there to get in at quarter to six or ten to six, we choose right. the ones out who get the seats, and people can decide to wait to see if somebody leaves or go home. Right. Which I mean, is what happens? They wouldn't have to sign up to be in the lottery. They show up, and if there's more than fifteen. We actually do a lottery as opposed to, to me, it also will minimize if people are out there, I was here before you were, or fighting in line, or that's part of how the REI sale is. It doesn't matter. You just Could you with. handle that, Ms. Nolan? Yes, ma'am, I believe I could. Mm -hmm. if, if I would like to say if we could have that done by noon rather than waiting until 4 p.m. Well, to do something Because you have like to that. call 15 no, people. No, I'm call saying, people and no, then but, that's, but I'm not talking about speakers. I, so I'm, I'm trying to simplify. She still has no, to I call understand. them. She well, has why would to, we have to call them if they've showed up here to come to the board meeting? Because you don't meeting. want them to come if they don't get this seat. Because it say 100 people want to come. I got a better well, well, hold on. Just let me, I'm not done. Sometimes people go a long time, so I'm trying to understand this. So how did you envision the 15 happening before I offered my harebrained idea? I envisioned <laughs> that we would communicate in advance to the world <laughs> that if you want to um, attend the meeting, it would be first come serve, first serve, come to the front door. So, and then we would let 15 people in. I'd probably bring them in one at a time just so they weren't all in a bunch on social right. distance. They would take their seat and then they have their seat. Right. Their so seating. you wouldn't be calling them. We had envisioned having potentially 15 right. or 30 or 100 people line up to get in. Right. And your vision was to take the first 15. My vision is to say, everybody gets a number. Here's your number. Mm -hmm. It all goes in the pot. We're pulling out 15 numbers, number 27, number 48, number right. 32. And that's, that's doable, too. I mean, yeah. I was, that seems I, more equitable. Head, I was envisioning a process kind of like how the, what the county commission It does uses. seem more. And less chaotic. We don't have the space they do at that courthouse. I mean, I, you right. know, I've been in county commissioner meetings a million times, gotten my number. Right. But less chaos in the parking lot to me if people are, okay, wait, and then we're going to call 15 numbers. There's two, yeah, there's more than one way to do this. But then we don't have to notify them in advance. Right. Right. I think that we can work it out. If the board says you want a lottery, then I think we we'll can send this out. back to the board clerk, Dr. Carr, and let mm -hmm. them figure out a way. What I'm trying to avoid is having people frustrated, especially if they're coming all the way from High Point or, you know, way mm -hmm. out southeast Guilford, eastern Guilford, and then they can't get in. I think that is frustrating. So... I had one more question. I know. I'm taking my time. It's my understanding, and I just want to state this, that North Carolina statute requires us to hear public comments once a month, but we are agreeing to hear them at every board meeting. Going above and beyond, as we actually have in the past, and have been more liberal than commissioners and others in sort of receiving comments. It is that what this recommendation it, is? It requires you to have a process for public comment. It isn't quite as prescriptive as you're saying, but it's certainly not required to be more than once a month if that's the root of the question. You're not required, every board is not required to do it any exact particular way, but you're not required to have public comment more than at a regular meeting. <laughs> I think we're only required to have five meetings a year. It's it's messier than that. But but right. if the so question yeah. is really, we're not trying we to constrain. To no. We are not trying to right. constrain public engagement. Right. You are having that is it constructive. As much. Yes. It might be critical. Right. We are not trying to constrain that. We right. are absolutely trying right. to encourage it and make it safe and equitable. You are right. complying with every legal requirement. Thank you. And in the past, we have not, or typically when we're doing a work session in or a retreat setting and you're digging in on a long topic, that typically has not been a time when you've done public comments, when it's been designated in that particular way. Right. You might have members of the public attend, but they're not commenting on providing public comment at that point in time in person. All right, Linda, Kim, then Anita. Okay. Um, I'm fine with doing a lottery. However, one thing I thought we could do, 
because I am concerned about people driving an extended period of time to only get here and find out they don't get in the meeting. So what I think you can do is let them email that they plan to intend, they, they can send it to Lisa. And at that point, when you decide you're pulling the names, you list them on the website and we tell people to check the website to see if you're one of the 15, okay? Mm -hmm. Instead of having an email, instead of before you leave, That's good. before you leave your house, you go here and see if you were the one of the, the lottery winners whatever you want to call it. And then Lisa doesn't have to call a bunch of, because there might be 50 people she has to call back and oh, say, right. you didn't make it. That's right. All right. And that'll take her all day long. All right. So by simply listening, and it's due to limited uh, availability for people to be in the building. Right. All right. Me personally, I don't want to drive up here. There'd be a big crowd out there and I can't get in. Now, I agree, I didn't want people to be limited as far as speaking, which we did get that clarified because I wasn't going to go with that one. That one bothered me because anybody that shows up, as long as they make it and can get in here and speak, then they deserve to be able to speak. I'm good with the 15. Um, and personally, I would like to move that we approve um, this uh, policy or this, whatever you want to call it, the uh, plan or... Uh, option for doing this for public, but Anita has questions. Kim is Kim is Anita. Anita. I think okay. you need a second. I need a second for approval. I'd second that. Okay. Kim. <laughs> I like that. Um, can you clarify how many people can be in this room in that regard with the three feet? Because I know you said 15 people and if i'm somebody who's coming to speak it's my intention to speak on something on your agenda item and i don't get selected to come and actually get my three minutes in front of us i don't i i see some frustration happening um in that regard and if every month i put my name in this lottery and i never get chosen then it's a fix, then it's, and God forbid, if another person had a chance in March and they got chosen again in April and they got to that mic for another three minutes, that's a whole lot of logistics and processes mm -hmm. that seems to be added on to a lottery. I get it, but I just see us taking on maybe some other kind of heat for a, a lottery kind of thing, okay? Mm -hmm. And if I'm that parent, that needs to speak to y'all. I want my three minutes in person. That's a problem for me. Okay, so I could see the first 15 people, whether they're speaking or not, whether they're signed up to speak or not, getting in here to get those 15 seats. Because I can get my friend here who's going to get that seat and call me and say, um, excuse me, you got my seat, right? Um, I'm swapping out with so and so. Yeah, we wouldn't be doing swapping. I'm, I, I don't. Know, I'm, I'm just saying, details. even if right. the number is called, my friend is getting here to get in the lottery, and if she gets called when I get here, by the time you let me in, let us in with my number, she gave me the number. Like I just see like a lot of not happy people. Okay. I rather one rule for everybody, whether you're speaking or want to just sit in here and hear us conduct the business. Right. Ms. Herbie, I would say until we're fully open, none of these processes are going to be perfect. And I would say let us see, um, for the most part, unless there's an issue, people aren't, you know, looking forward to Tuesday nights with us. So uh, let's, <laughs> let's see how it goes. And then mm -hmm. I think if it's a problem, you can keep changing it. But I think that as more and more people are vaccinated, that the meetings will start to open up more. We didn't think we would get to this place. So I think we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Anita, Betty, then Deborah. Okay. Um, I didn't say I couldn't win this motion because I'm not sure I understand what we're doing. Is okay. the lottery for the 15 seats 
or is the lottery for whoever can, the 10 speakers will have in 30 minutes, which is the lottery for? I thought my, what I heard was for the in-person seating. So the lotteries for the mm -hmm. seating, the, the speakers are first come, first mm -hmm. serve. As they are now, they would follow our current practice. So it's really 25 people. What? Well, they, not necessarily. It could be. It could be. It's possible the speaker would be in one of the seats. So I get to speak, but I got to leave. Unless right. Unless you've got a seat. I will tell you that some districts are only doing public speakers and they're only doing them for a certain amount of time and they come in one at a time, speak and leave, and that's it. We are trying to be a little more expansive and try to be a little more inclusive within the different guidelines and at three feet of social distance, we set up the chairs. I literally had my tape measure with, my <laughs> with three feet and we counted the number of people that we can, number of rows we could get in, as well as having, you know, um, seats for the media and the little skinny table that they use. And with every, all the seats doing the forward facing and thought we could safely right now until more people get vaccinated and we get different rules for public schools facilities. And that's one thing I do want to emphasize. Some people are confused and they're like, well, my restaurant doesn't have to do that. The restaurant doesn't have to follow the guidelines of the pu for public school facilities. Ours are more restrictive <laughs> than others. And the latest one they just came out with didn't change, change the masking requirement, for example. So, and, and who did, who? Mm -hmm. Who? The latest one that came out from Oh, the who? latest, I said that earlier. It's the North Carolina Department of Health and Human <coughs> Services. Okay, so it's not the, the governor. The Strong Schools Public Toolkit. It's not the governor. The governor has issued executive orders that we cannot go against. The governor recently affirmed that uh, North Carolina remains under a state of emergency for COVID-19. And then the his appointee or the staff at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services references those executive orders in the Strong Schools Toolkit and are still requiring masking in public school facilities as a requirement and uh, for school districts that are in Plan A, which is basically what we're, we're in as we finished out school, they have recommended three to six feet in terms of social distancing. Um, we, um, after conferring with other school districts to see what they are doing, we went with three feet, to, again, to try to err more on the side of inclusivity. That's about 15 people. Yes, ma'am. Final oh, I'm question. Sorry. I, I'm, I'm. <laughs> All right, final question is, are we, Guilford County Schools, still in a state of emergency? The state is. Which includes all public schools. So the state is still, has not, the governor has not lifted the state of emergency. The Department of Public Health has not revised the guidelines for schools. They still include social distancing and other things. But they did revise them. Yes, they've been revised a number of times, but right. they have not lifted masks for students, et cetera. And adults. And adults, sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I agree with the lottery, um, and I think we need to let Ms. Nolan figure out a way how to handle that and get with um, either the superintendent or the board chair and, and vice chair. Um, I think we are doing great by accommodating the community. And the lottery, I think the best thing because of the fact we do have working parents and working people, so therefore someone who's not working can be here at two o'clock and sit all day and wait and be the first one in. So I think that's a great idea. And that would take care of all logistics. Thank you. Thank you. Deb? You know, whatever I had to say, honest to goodness, has gone out the window. <laughs> uh, but I do want, as a working parent who got off at five from Winston-Salem and drove here as fast as I could, mm -hmm. um, don't anybody tell the officers outside, please. Mm -hmm. uh, and still only barely managed to get here in time. I, yes, please, lottery system. It's mm -hmm. only fair. 
I'm not the only working parent, and I'm fortunate enough to be a married working parent. My mom was a single working parent. She would have never made it. They deserve to be heard, too. Thank you. I just want to re-clarify what the motion is. It's to have the lottery for the 15 people get coming in the bill in in this room. The speakers are not on a lottery. The speakers are first come, first serve, and we will stay for the 30 minutes at three minutes per speaker. And if we have extra speakers, we can look at the option of letting them speak after the meeting or some of those options that we have. So I just want to clarify what the motion is. But the standing standard would be the 30 minute. Right. Right. That'd be the standard. Right. Okay. Okay. I, I just wanted to say my only concern is, is not everyone has access to the internet and, um, and, and even broadband connection. And so, um, you know, there are still people who are going to be left out um, because, of, because of those access related issues, I think that we talked about a lot, you know, during the pandemic. So, yeah. I mean, they, I heard Dr. Carr say they can call to register and Lisa could ask, do you have access to the internet to check? And if you don't, I think Lisa is typically extraordinarily accommodating. She, then yeah, she but then call. that gets back to Lisa having to call people. But not I mean, everybody. I, I know, but I know. not everybody, right? Yeah. But those who need that. So I think have, that needs to be a part of it. Um, I, I think, even though I still think it leaves people out, but um, but I think this is the best we can do. May I ask, can they call to sign up to speak? I want to remind us that poor people have the least amount of leisure time, cannot leave their jobs to go wait to stand for hours. Yeah, to wait to speak. They can yes. Call or email like they do now. But that's not first come, first serve. Oh, I meant first come, first serve once in terms of um, okay. communication. So the current process for speakers we're following, they, they can call up to 5 p.m. or be here in person. It's in the order of the request received. Right. So um, if they call at one o'clock and nobody else is called, they're right. first. And, okay. and if I could add, that's how we did this before the pandemic. Right. They were time stamped. I yes. just wanted to clarify so Thank everyone you. understood. Right. And I was only referring to the other first come, first serve, thinking about for the people in attendance. And now the motion is to do some kind of lottery to make it more equitable. For the, only for people. For the 15 in attendance, yes. correct. Very good. Um, are we going to, um, Is this, this of course applies to our meetings in High Point. When will be, um, meeting in High Point again soon as well? I will have to reach out to, uh, to, their, to their board and their management to, to find that out. Okay. But I'll be glad to do that yeah. Monday. We need to get out of the way. Yeah. I, I didn't know if Diane had a um, comment or a question or if we're ready to vote. I, I hadn't heard from her, so I didn't know if she sent a signal to you, Lisa. It's all right. Just quick thought. It is. Yep, she is. Oh. Hold on just a minute, Diane. We're trying to get the mic to you, to the speaker. I'm sorry. I have to yeah. All right. We, we asked the staff to come back with a plan. They came back with a plan, and then we take it and chop it up and make a sausage. Either we let the staff, who knows better about, you know, how to work these procedures, do their jobs, or what is the point? And we just spent 30 minutes undoing what, sta what we asked staff to do. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. So we are now at um, time for a vote. Um, if everyone will cast your vote as soon as Lisa sets it up. And Diane, I'll get to you in just a minute. Diane, how do you vote? No. All right, that passes by a vote of, uh, what's that, seven to two? Six. Six to two, sorry. Right. Uh, that passes by a vote of six to two. Thank you. <laughs> Pat's not able to join us. He's um, at duty tonight and unable to get access to the internet. We thank him for his service. Um, so I'm back to my board, uh, my chair comments. Uh, the second issue is um, 
Uh, the national misinformation campaign that is creating a false narrative and a manufactured crisis about our public schools, and in particular, our superintendent. As I stated earlier, there is a, um, that this is a misinformation campaign underway that is seeking to manufacture a new crisis in our public schools. And this crisis centers on critical race theory, which is not part of the North Carolina course of study all Guilford County schools follow, nor is it taught in our classrooms. The purpose of this fake crisis is maddeningly familiar to any serious student of history. Sadly, in our area, this manufactured crisis has taken on a particularly ugly, racist, threatening, misogynistic tone. The fact that this campaign is targeting our superintendent, a trailblazing educator, dynamic leader, should not come as a surprise. Those involved should also know that we will not let this situation go unchecked. We have given the most recent hate-filled, violent threat rants to law enforcement to investigate. If the investigation yields evidence of criminal activity, we will file charges and we will push for prosecution. We will stand against hate. We will stand, stay focused on transforming learning and life opportunities for all children. If you want to learn about the real Guilford County Schools, I encourage you to read just one senior profile on our uh, story on our website. And while we always work to improve, our recent graduates remind us that we have a lot to be proud of and a lot to be thankful for for this district. So let's keep our eyes on the prize or get our eyes back on the prize and do what's right for children in our community. Um, that concludes my comments. We are now at the superintendent uh, comments report. Dr. Contreras. I didn't take them. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take them. I just have them. Hold on just a minute. I think I have them. Okay. And they are. If you're like a student in a classroom. When the teacher, when the calls, teacher on calls on you and you're looking for your paper, you know you've got it. I had the plate. I had the pleasure to hold, host our valedictorians, salutatorians, and parents, and to honor these graduates at a luncheon on Saturday on the campus of High Point Universities. These student leaders are an exceptional group, and I feel certain their success is just beginning. Congratulations to our district relations team led by Chief of Staff Nora Carr, which earned a prestigious gold medallion award from the National School Public Relations Association for the successful Bond 2020 campaign. Only five gold medallion awards were given this year to school districts across the United States for superior educational public relations programs and campaigns grounded in strategic communication best practices. The district will receive its award at the NSPRA conference in July. Congratulations to you, we're so proud. This week, Guilford County Schools opened the 2021 summer learning programs. So far, more than 11,000 students have attended at more than 100 different sites for summer, summer learning opportunities, including summer schools, art, summer school, arts, robotics, coding, and academically gifted camps. Guilford County Schools is employing more than 1,600 staff members for summer learning programs. As our students continue learning this summer, so will our teachers. More than 200 unique professional learning opportunities are available through our Performance Matters online system with more opportunities added daily. Guilford County Schools application to the North Carolina Education Corps has been approved. This will allow Guilford County Schools to work with a partnership of more than 20 other districts across the state to provide early literacy tutoring and interventions to students across the district. 40 trained tutors will work between 10 and 25 hours a week and will be based at individual schools to assist students. These staff members will receive training this summer and early fall on the science of reading and will begin their work in schools in September. Congratulations to the Northwest High and Grimsley High varsity cheerleaders 
who came in first and second place in the state cheerleading championship. This is the third year in a row that Northwest has won the state title. And Millis Road Elementary students are featured in a new exhibit at the High Point Museum. The students captured their feelings and experiences one year after the pandemic began through photographs, writing, and art. The resulting projects were used to create an outdoor display that will remain at the museum throughout the summer. I'll be sure to check that out. And the semifinalists have been announced for this year's Teacher of the Year. And they are Tom Anderson, Christine Joyner Green Education Center, Shanice Foy at Northeast High, Gerard Harris, Western High, Leah Carper, Northern High, Elizabeth Jones, Summerfield Elementary, Tyrell Lee, Southeast Middle, Melissa Mann, Western Middle, Marsha Moyd Williams, Gillespie Park Elementary, Lindsay Stevenson, Greensboro College, Middle College, and Ashley Witten, Sumner Elementary. We look forward to announcing the winner at Celebration of Excellence this September. And on behalf of the board, I'd like to wish a happy birthday to Dot Kearns, former board member and namesake of Kearns Academy, who is turning 90. Dot served on the Board of Education for both High Point City Schools and Guilford County Schools. She was also on the Guilford County Board of Commissioners and served as its first female chairperson. She has been a longtime advocate for the children of this community and is still doing so at 90 years old. Happy birthday, Dot. Finally, I'd like to remind our families that schools and district offices will be closed the week of July 5th in honor of the 4th of July. We hope everyone has a restful and enjoyable break. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. We are now at action items. Uh, action item A, after school care enrichment services, the ACES program fee, fee schedule. Dr. Contreras. And Dr. Oakley is coming forward if you have any questions. Entertaining a motion. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. Is there a motion? Thank you, Diane. Is there a second? Second. All right, all those in favor, please vote electronically. Discussion. I'm sorry. I'm any sorry. Discussion or question? <laughs> I, I didn't see any. Oh, uh, Linda? All right, please vote electronically. Diane? Yes. yes. Great. That passes unanimously. And I'd like to thank the board for that vote uh, because that does mean not only are we reopening ACEs, but that does mean that uh, also the ACEs workers will receive a raise to $15 an hour. So thank you very much for your support, uh, Board of Education, and your advocacy. Thank you. The next thing on our agenda, item B, is the 2020-2021 Budget Amendment Transfers Report. Ms. Henry. Thank you. And this evening, um, we will be presenting uh, the ESSER budget to the board. So if uh, you can place that on the screen. Oh. Sure. Yes. We had, a, we had a presentation on or about May the 12th in small groups, and I just now realized that the one that was at our place tonight has changed from the one that we got that stated May 12th. As you're going through this, could you explain what changed? The bottom line is the same, but the allocations have changed. So it's mainly just the presentation of it that has changed. So I'll go through this. So under priority one, we're really excited to present this budget, which uh, was due to the state on May 7th and was approved. Uh, we have several priorities. And while it is funded by ESSER, it does uh, support 
the board's strategic plan and many of the initiatives that we have not been able to support over time. So you see for sustaining the virtual academy, as you know, there are uh, items that uh, we're unable to fund out of the general fund. We wanted to make sure we're able to support those positions. And you see that uh, in the budget for multiple years. Uh, we continue to fund high dosage tutoring, one-to-one -one tutoring for students and expanding the tutoring core. I want to just emphasize that some of what you see in this budget, um, there are other dollars in other funds as well, but this is just the ESSER piece to it. You see increased access to advanced courses and to tuition-free college courses. This is an initiative uh, uh, for equity courses. It's called, um, Equi could you name the program again? The National Equity Lab allows um, students, high school students to take um, courses at Ivy League colleges from their high school. Right. Uh, next is the data warehouse. This is a way for us to uh, make certain that we, in a more comprehensive way, collect data so that we have better information for making decisions. Uh, next, you see information on summer school and fifth quarter. And in the first quarter, in the first column uh, where it says FY 2021, those are actually expenses from the first CARES Act. Then you see extension of the school year to mitigate learning loss. As you know, uh, the first year we decided to uh, extend primarily for the teachers to make sure that uh, we were providing more professional development for teachers. And then for those 25 restart schools, uh, we are going to start staggering uh, which of those schools uh, will extend uh, the calendar for in terms of more days for students. Priority two is closing the digital divide. And you see funding for Wi-Fi infrastructure over three years in the amount of $3.5 million. However, the FCC has allocated $7 billion that we can apply for. It's not like ESSER, which is a guarantee, uh, but the application period opens next week. We will be applying for these funds, so hopefully we can reallocate this $3.5 million to something else uh, because we'll be applying for the technology expenses to come out of the dollars in that FCC budget. Uh, I believe the $14 million might uh, might qualify for that as, as well. Is that right? Certainly, it's our intent to, to try to get it there. Uh, so that we may be able to reallocate that $14 million as well, uh, along with the $19.5 million that you see. So we will be applying for that total $37 million, if allowable, out of the... Uh, FCC fund will keep you informed and bring that back to the board uh, once we know and once we attend the webinars on uh, the FCC uh, emergency fund uh, and know exactly what the parameters are. <laughs> the next priority is creating strong post-secondary pathways and I shared with you when I spoke to uh, you in small groups or individually, that this is the area that we had the most work to do in is making sure our students are prepared for life after high school. You see, we have tuition-free college credit for high school students. So under fiscal year 2022, there was the cost for the 14 passenger uh, vans for each comprehensive high school to make sure students could uh, participate in the college and career promise. Uh, we have many students that want to participate, but we can't transport them. And that has been a barrier to them having tuition free college. Uh, we also want to uh, supply or provide the book cost and that uh, you see that in future years. 
We also need a system to track post-secondary outcomes. We want to know uh, where they are. Are they in the workforce? Are they successful in two-year college, four-year college? What kind of salaries they're making? And we can partner with the Department of Labor and other agencies to make sure that uh, our investments uh, and their education uh, is uh, yielding uh, positive outcomes for our students. The next line item is the college and career post-secondary advisory support, making sure we have post-secondary advisors in all high schools. Some high schools already have this through their title funds, so this will be an addition. And for some high schools, this is their first position that helps uh, students with uh, making sure they are applying to at least one uh, community college or four-year college, completing the FAFSA, and actually enrolling. We share data that there has been a national decrease in enrollment in college by 13.1%. And for poor students, for students of color, it has decreased even more. So these positions, and these are individuals who will be um, highly trained to do this, will make sure that students actually apply and enroll. The next is making sure uh, the college application is completed, the FAFSA is completed. Uh, the next item is scholarships for GCS students to enter the teaching profession. That's paying the full UNC system tuition for four years. The next item is the dual generation workforce development programming, allowing the parents of our students to participate in the evenings or weekends and our career academies, our signature academies, or other uh, CTE programs that we have. And we're working with our uh, chambers to uh, partner and to get staff uh, to get these programs up and running. We know that the socioeconomic status of the family is directly related to the academic outcomes of students. So we want to make sure that our families, our parents, uh, have uh, high-paying, uh, high-skilled jobs. Next, you see an allocation per student for library media center collections for two years in a row. Our library media collections are very old. This is for every single school in the district. The next item is for digital learning resources, online textbooks and digital student materials. The teachers asked us after the pandemic, please uh, never return to uh, the state we were in where schools did not have access to digital learning resources. So these are ongoing uh, line item for resources in our schools in the amount of $12 million. The next few line items are for material supplies and professional development for science, technology, engineering, math, global languages, uh, materials and supplies for our English language learners, arts, civics, our uh, gifted program. The next item is instrument replacement for schools, uh, the schools that need that. Then you see band uniform replacement. Unfortunately, our band uniform replacement cycle is 15 to 18 years. I shared that um, with you in our small group uh, meetings. So that's far too long. The next priority is investing in our staff. So you see professional learning for our K-3 teachers. That's the science of reading training. You see professional learning stipend for our newly hired teachers to go through a much more comprehensive, robust uh, new teachers training. And we're developing that as we speak and they're gonna start going through that this summer. Then we have professional learning for our mentor teachers. Uh, that's a stipend for the mentor. Is that the stipend for the mentor teachers or the mentors?
the mentors that support the new teachers. So this is the stipend for the mentors, <laughs> which we've never been able to do before. Uh, you, we asked for volunteers. Uh, so now we will have stipends for the mentors who support the 350 mentees. <laughs> Once they complete their, so it's the stipend to complete the training to serve. Right, they must mentor. complete the training. Thank you. Uh, we continue our new leaders training and executive coaching for principals, assistant principals, and aspiring principals. Uh, you see the professional development and education center uh, for our teachers, support staff, and families and educators uh, at the Hampton site. Uh, I do want to make a note that while this is approved at the state level, our auditors also have to say that this is an acceptable use of the funds in that um, the COVID funds must address uh, issues related to COVID. So our case is because so many people were, um, we experienced so much learning loss and so many families of out of work. This is a workforce development center and our teachers need training to address learning loss, but we are going to get approval first from our auditors. Uh, if the auditors do not allow this uh, capital expense, we will have to reallocate this $35 million. Uh, you see the newcomer school at Andrews to address um, the 110 languages spoken in this district and the large number of newcomer students in the High Point area. Those students currently have to ride the bus all the way over to uh, the Western Guilford area where the newcomer school is. So now we'll have one newcomer school in uh, Greensboro and one in High Point. You see an increase in interpretation services to address the 110 languages uh, we serve. We won't be able to address all of them, but this certainly will assist us. You see, we have an early learning center in East Greensboro for a pre-K center. Again, uh, same holds true for what I said with the professional development center. Uh, we will have to get uh, clearance from the auditors. And if we do not receive clearance, we will have to reallocate that $7.5 million. The next item you see is pandemic-related nursing supports for schools. Uh, some of this will have to be reallocated for classified staff raises, but uh, we fully expect to use some of it for nurses. We do not anticipate that we'll be able to find 40 plus nurses, but we know we will be able to find some, and some of this funding will be used for nurses. Next is the mobile buses for community supports, including um, the homework buses, the tutoring buses, uh, the health buses, uh, arts buses for students uh, that uh, cannot afford um, their music lessons. And I think for uh, those of us who attend graduation ceremonies, and this year is in a great example, but in the past, you notice some schools have bands, some don't. And that's a result of elementary students coming up and, and playing music uh, or having music lessons. So by the time they get to high school, the high school has a band or they don't uh, as a result of how many students in their feeder schools were able to participate in music lessons during their uh, childhood. So we're trying to address that issue. We're also trying to create some uh, uh, greater community partnerships uh, through wraparound services beginning in High Point. So you see an allocation there and increasing our professional uh, learning for teachers and support staff in uh, SEL. Our SEL coordinator is only a 10-month position, so we want to make that a 12-month position, especially since we're doing so much extensive professional learning during the summer. And we want to continue the attendance campaign. Uh, you can't learn if you're not in school, and we still are missing many children. You'll see in the next priority, we have recruiting, retaining, and rewarding highly effective staff. So the first line item is $14 million. 
uh, for two years, 14 million each year. That includes 10 million for the bonuses for all classified staff to get them to the uh, $15 an hour. And then there's about $4 million a year each year to recruit highly effective teachers to the 25 lowest performing schools. And you have that list uh, in front of you. The next is a program for teacher residencies to recruit uh, math teachers to our uh, schools that have the least number of certified math teachers and teachers with actual math degrees. And those schools are Allen Middle, Andrews High, Dudley High, Ferndale Middle, Hairston Middle, High Point Central, Jackson Middle, Northeast High, Northeast Middle, Smith High, and Swan Middle. Some of these schools don't have a single math teacher that has a math degree. And what we'll do is place them in a classroom for a year while they're either a senior in college or a master's student. And we will pay them uh, a full year uh, salary as well as pay their uh, senior year in college or that year as a master's student the tuition uh, while they work alongside a highly effective teacher and they will give us five years back in return teaching math in one of those schools. We also have a program, tuition assistance for our classified and support staff as an alternative pathway to teaching, trying to get our uh, classified staff to finish their uh, degrees and come back and teach for us. We have support for human resources to recruit for all of these outstanding programs um, that I'm mentioning here. We also have partnerships to retain highly qualified teachers by working with technical assistant partners who do nothing except fill long-term subs, help us find certified teachers, uh, and work with us to fill uh, hard to fill vacancies. Many districts are finding a lot of success with that. Uh, they do all of the background checks and uh, find people who have math degrees or degrees to teach ESL or bilingual education, all of the areas that districts have difficulty with. The next priority, of course, is reopening schools and keeping them open. You see uh, funding to create at least one outdoor learning space at every single school. Uh, the next line item is $26 million for maintaining ventilation and improving air quality. You then see funding for uh, keeping the community informed about the ESSER funds, maintaining the new ESSER website we'll have so that the community knows how we're spending the dollars and any other information that we have to provide. And uh, as you know, we had to continue to produce document after document during this pandemic crisis. We uh, will continue to provide training on sanitizing and minimizing the spread of infectious diseases and continue to provide PPE and supplies to sanitize and clean. Another $4 million for that, so about $35 million on reopening schools and keeping them open. Then you see the indirect costs over five years and the amount of $11 million. So with that, I'll take any questions that board members might have. Uh, I'm sorry, right now we have Kim and then Diane. In regard to uh, students um, doing the tuition free college courses, are our immigrant and undocumented students allowed to also participate in things like that? Yes, in fact, it's an easier way for do, to do that because um, you know, by Supreme Court case, they're still in high school, so they can't be kept out of those courses. Okay. So it's pretty guaranteed. If they take them in high school, they're guaranteed those two years, at least an associate's degree, if they so choose. Um, in regard to creating the indoor and outdoor learning spaces, how does that impact our capital plans going forward 
in creating those spaces now? It it wouldn't. It's like the space we created at Faust. Okay. I showed okay. photos of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, Diane. Oh, okay. she's good, Linda. My first uh, question, is Dr. Contreras. Uh, I didn't hear you say anything about mental health. You may have, but I didn't. I didn't hear that. Is is there any funds allotted for the mental health uh, services for the students or staff? I did. I mentioned it in priority number six. Okay. Mm -hmm. As I heard you say. For mental health coordination uh, to support community schools and SEL supports for teachers. Okay. My next question, I heard you say um, prof uh, professional development for classifiers to lead to becoming teachers, but what about professional uh, or employees uh, so that they do a better job? When the bus drivers came, they kept saying that they needed In what topic? Huh? You're, you're cutting out, Diane. Um, she's talking about recruiting retaining. Um, okay. Tuition. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, you were going in and out. I heard okay, well, you. I heard you say. You want me to try? I heard you, you say something again? about professional development for bus drivers, but I didn't hear on what topic. Okay. What I said was, I heard you say. Uh, uh, professional development for uh, classified employees who want to go into a pathway to become teachers. But what about professional and, or high skills training for classified employees who just want to, you know, improve their skills where they are? And the example I gave was when the bus drivers came to us and they were saying that they would want, would like training to be able to better deal with the students. Uh, when they had them on the bus. Right, so you can't use ESSER for that. It has to be related to COVID or learning loss. So we okay. can um, address, we can um, provide training for classified uh, staff to um, go on and become teachers because it addresses learning loss. But we can't just help bus drivers become bus drivers or be, you know, more highly skilled drivers. We can use other funds for that, but not okay. ESSER. Okay, and then my last comment is I don't have a problem with the training center, but I cannot support uh, the uh, location that has been identified for where it will be built. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Anita, then Deborah. Um, I have about 25 questions. Do you want to make, wait, let me go last. I mean, I'm just trying to be courteous. Um, you can. Deborah? I only have one. Okay. <laughs> um, under priority three, the scholarships for students to enter the teaching profession, um, I understand that we'll pay for a full four years of college, which is fantastic. Are we expecting a, um, like a return investment on that um, year for year? Five years. All right. Good. I love it. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Anita. Here we go. Um, first of all, the, as I said before, the sheet that we got on May 12th and the sheet that stated May 27th, there are seven categories that are different. I can't reconcile them and listen to what you're saying. Um, so my questions all go back to the May 12th sheet. I don't think you should because this is what is submitted to the state. But that's, I haven't had time to analyze the May 27th. So if these questions okay. don't apply, just say so. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, there, um, let's see. What's the total dollar amount we anticipate receiving? So with, with all three, 
the CARES Act, ESSER two and ESSER three, it's the three hundred and seven million five hundred seventy one thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars. Okay, I talked to DPI today, and um, they gave me a figure that we should have received by now. Can I reconcile that to what we have received now, as of now? So, yes, I mean, and that's what's in the the budget amendment. That's part of what we're we're talking about. It's not the three hundred and seven. It it should be the three hundred. If they gave you, well, they probably they may have included more than than we just included. They because there's some little chunks that address specific things. Okay, the have, figure they gave me was CARES twenty one million, mm -hmm. Esther two eighty eight point five million, Esther three one thirty two point eight. Uh, which so, is this yes. is received 242.3 million so the 132.8 is two-thirds of our planning allotment I understand for that. three yes but they they DP they being DPI required that we enter into the application and into the budgeting system the state budgeting system the full amount the 187 or $188 million. Yeah, they told me it was two thirds. Right. So we're committing money that we've yet to receive, but believe we will. Now we've re we've got approval for it and, and we've gotten- But we haven't received system. it. Well, we never receive it until we spend it. It's kind of like the okay. state um, money. Of all the dollars in the 307 million, um, I believe that some of them are supplanting, like the band uniforms. Uh, there are different ones, but I'll let you tell me what's supplanting. I, I don't, I mean, I, so number one, supplanting is, there's not an issue with supplanting with the ESSER money, just, just to make that clear to start with. Um, things that we are already paying for um, with other another funding source, We've we've paid for some digital learning resources, as the superintendent mentioned, last year and this year. But we've done that from savings because we didn't have students in schools. So while we so they it wasn't um, a part of our initial budget for the first year. It it was a result of um, savings that we had. So I don't know that they would that that would classify as supplanting, but those are dollars we have spent. Um, is there a supplanting year? rule with no, that, Right, that, there's yeah, no rule with supplanting. With, right. um, the, we use, uh, we've used uh, capital money to do some instrument replacement, certainly at not the degree that we need to and not the degree that, that we have included here. Uh, band uniforms, we've been able to do one a year and not the, um, looks like we're planning on about five a year um, here, so we are adding, um, we're supplanting, I guess, one band in uniform. We're moving it to this. Um, other things? I don't see, I don't see anything else that we are, that we are currently paying for from another funding source. I mean, again, these are not recurring dollars, so we would not want to to I understand move things that we aware of. It. Mm -hmm. um, talk about the four facilities we plan on vacating and or repurposing, assuming the auditors give approval. Four facilities we plan on vacating. So I, I think we talked about if we do the PD center, we would um, we would no longer use the Laughlin site. Um, we would be able to potentially um, combine the Franklin Boulevard and the Washington Street um, into one building, and I don't know which one we would um, com com use, but I don't know that there are two others. Okay, what about uh, the repurposing in Andrews? So Andrews? Yeah, because I think I said vacating and or repurposing. No, we're not. It's co-locating the schools yeah. because it's so empty. But we will, I mean, we can't 
I think we're putting three through three through twelve, 12 there. One hundred students. Okay, and I get that, but we can't put a third grader in a high school sure situation. You you're you're upfitting the schools. That's what I'm asking. Yes, that's what I was asking yeah. her to talk about. Oh, okay. Oh. We're upfitting the school, so they're totally different entrances, bathrooms, office space, right. so that it's the, uh, the children from the newcomer school are not where the children at Andrews. Oh, the other one you talk, we talk about that we need to address, um, and I'm doing a lot of this because the public has no idea what's in this okay. plan, and I've spent the better part of a week studying it, trying to figure it out, but the other one was Gillespie. Right, so first I just wanna say the public does have an idea because we met with uh, groups all over speaking to them about this. So we did extensive community engagement on this plan. Um, Gillespie is a potential for this, but there are others as well because uh, there are several small schools, but Gillespie has about 130 students and could um, those students, it's so small, uh, it's easy enough to make that school a pre-K site. But in East Greensboro, there's several very small schools that could become pre-K sites. But I think we specifically, in my meeting, I think we specifically right. talked I, about Gillespie. We said we were thinking of Gillespie Park because it is so small and there are so few students there. Um, so my question then, and, and I know the answer to this before I ask it, but if student reassignment results, um, from the repurposing of these facilities, where we're gonna put people, the kids, students. So the only one that would require any student reassignment would potentially be Gillespie Park. And so remember that in that area, you have schools that are so small, they could go to one of the, I think there are four schools uh, around them and they're all within two to three miles of that school. Okay. Um, and I know I'm jumping around in here, but can you define tuition assistance for developing district legal capacity? That's not in there. Did, was it removed? Yes. Okay. Um, here you go. Buses for tutoring and for transportation and books for high school students receiving tuition-free college credit. Many of our students have been duly enrolled for a number of years. How did we handle their books and transportation and how is this different? They had to provide their own transportation and pay for their own, own books. books. Yeah. So we will start doing that for students who, under this plan, who are Correct. duly enrolled. Okay. Uh, capital expenditures. We've got instruments, uniforms, buildings, buses, um, anything else that's a capital expenditure in there? Yeah, we've got the H, the H, air quality. HVAC. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think I included that under buildings, but okay, air quality. Um, I had asked earlier, so I know the answer to this, but the 37 new administrative positions in the Andrews Newcomers School, my question was- So those aren't administrative? Well, the 37 positions, okay. excuse me. Uh -huh. uh, it doesn't say administrative here. I did not mean to say that. Uh, the 37 positions, you're saying we will hold harmless the schools from which these students come for- For three long? years. Three years. For th three years of the grant. Okay, cell tower. Uh, who will own it? Who will maintain it? So I, I anticipate and we'll work this out legally with um, that it'll be an easement on our property, but we will, we will, we are in the, would you call it a consortium? TDI. TDI that is, that is going to own, own the cell tower. Uh, so the money that the superintendent made reference to, um, the 3.5. That we hope to get mm -hmm. from another source. Uh, would that still do the same thing? Yes, that, that money is, is 
for technology. And for that's access. a grant. I mean, would it pay for a cell tower rather than paying for it out of ESSA funds? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's the intent of those dollars. The 14 million, well, it was, I don't know what it is now, but the 14 million that was dedicated, designated for communication tools, mass notifications, access points in elementary and high school. Explain what that really means in layman's terms. Sure. So that is a, a district-wide voice over IP system that will allow us to communicate with all schools uh, simultaneously. So if there's an emergency and we need to get a message out or uh, it'll act as intercoms within the school so that they can, uh, lots of schools don't have intercoms or they're broken. Um, so this will be a, a tool that a school can use, that can be used within a school for mass communica or communication throughout the school as well. Um, also the access points, um, when we had the uh, PACE grant, um, race to the top money, we did access points in middle schools because all middle schoolers received a tablet, uh, but we haven't gotten um, in elementary school and high schools to that degree. Um, so we need to get access points. Now that every student has a device, we needed more access points in our high schools and our elementary schools. So explain how we would get an access point with our cell tower or whatever it is. Okay, so those are two separate things. The cell right. tower is to provide um, internet service to our students when they are home. Um, and, and we're piloting it in, a, in an urban area um, and, and the cell tower will emit the signal and I, I don't know enough to use t terminology, so I'm just gonna use how I would explain it. We'll emit the signal. Um, the, the student's family will pro be provided a receiver box and then that'll allow yeah, them to have internet in their home. The access points are for in our buildings, in our okay. school buildings. Okay, understand Sorry. the difference. One cell tower would accomplish what we need? Well, this is, again, this is a pilot to start. Um, and then if it works out, that's funding for future years would be, would fund additional ones. But we're gonna start um, with a pilot. Okay, uh, restart schools. How are they funded now? So restart um, really means you get the difference between the average teacher salary and the actual teacher salary and some charter-like flexibilities as, design, as defined by the state. Um, so they're funded the same way as all of our other schools are funded. <laughs> What this is referring to are those extended year calendars. So this year, if you'll remember, our restart schools are on a different calendar where they have um, additional weeks of professional development, February, March, and one other month, October maybe. Um, and so this is making sure, um, um, this is, as the superintendent said, we're going to hope to move that focus from teacher professional learning days to actual student days in the coming years. So 21-22, there's weeks for professional learning built into the restart calendar. 22-23 and beyond in this grant period, we plan to add additional student days to the restart calendar for a more balanced calendar with less time off for students and opportunities for um, tutoring and intervention. So we will have more like the quote unquote books <laughs> model in our restart schools where they get extra actual extra instructional days. That's correct. But they don't get that now. Right now it's a t additional teacher professional Just learning teacher days, days not student for 21-22. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there's one item and I don't know if it's still in this one but I didn't understand what it was. It said professional learning infrastructure to support increased investments Parentheses, 64 million in professional learning, parentheses, but the line item is only 900,000. Yeah, that's that's no longer in the ESSER grant. What did it mean? It, it meant when we had all this these additional dollars for professional learning that our small professional learning department was gonna need some support and assistance in, in managing that for three years. And managing the 64 million Right. that we mm -hmm. would like to spend in profession. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So this was for the staff to management. 
to manage it, but it's not in there anymore? It's not in the ESSER funds, no. Okay. Why not? Because we'll be using a different funding source for that. Okay. Um, what is Civics Education and Professional Development 2.25 million? Um, do we not teach civics now? So what is that for? They, so in all of those areas, we haven't been providing textbooks and materials updates because we only receive, what's our uh, textbook allotment per year? It's probably about 2.1 to 2.4 million dollars. Right. So in all of those areas, we'll be able to buy textbooks and supplies. So 2.25 million is mainly for civics and professional development right so you see an amount for each area okay i think in the sheet that the original sheet you were seeing it's been renamed on the new sheet it's the same amount but it's just material supplies and professional learning on civics okay a lot of stuff's the, been like i said seven of the nine system. categories have been moved right. around mm -hmm. so um there's 20 million dollars in bonuses for the classified staff to bring their pay to 15 dollars an hour and i fully support that my concern is ESSER funding. Um, this is just for two years, and it will be a bonus because it has to be a one-time expenditure. I get that, too. What's the plan after that? I think uh, Mrs. Hayes and our uh, vice chair were at the county meeting where they have assured us they are going to pick this up in okay. year three. Ms. Jenkins was there, too. So that would be, they were going to pick up $10 million a year. I don't know how they're going to do it, but they said they will pick this up as a raise. Um, there's, there was um, $171,145 for an ombudsman for support per year for three years. What yes. do they do? For who? An ombudsman. ombudsman. For? Ombudsman. We, it's not, it's in, not there. in there. So that was removed yeah. also. Okay, thank you. Linda? Yes. Um, no, don't have that many. Oh, thank you. Um, I do have under priority one accelerator. What is the increased project management capacity? What is that? I meant to ask that. Yeah. That's, not, that's no longer in there either. Oh, I'm sorry. There that's again, I... We looked at the old ones. Yeah, and that's went. clear. So, Thank you. So we did look at them. Okay. All right. Number two. Um, I'm very concerned about the close to two million for an assessment system and data warehouse. Um, I'm concerned. I have heard from parents about Google. I had a, I had a long long talk with a gentleman that is concerned about the tracking of, a, of students' uh, information. Um, and that, you know, student privacy and parents, and I'm very concerned about that. I mean, people are tired of their children being tracked. And tired, they're worried about how much tracking children are being tracked. Um, also, I am concerned about the amount of testing that we're doing, okay? Um, I need, we need to be focused on in face instructional time, which in my view has gone down, not up. Um, I know I always hear professional development is the key to whether or not I, I'm kind of at, I believe that. But anyway, I think um, that's very concerning and deserves a little more um, spelled out. Because one thing I'm, I'm curious about, if we approve this amendment, am I also approving all these things yes but they are already approved by the state so because the state said you could do it it's approved and we don't need board approval at all well so then I could say I don't agree with something and I could do something about it I'm just saying you know we've, we've got a lot of things in here that parents are have no clue about and that is one that's very concerning to me what the data warehouse because yep. this there's not an assessment line in there 
It says assessment systems and data warehouse. No, it says oh. data warehouse. Okay, well, on the old one. I know, but we didn't submit the old one. We submitted the new one. Well, I'm like Anita. I had to go by the one I had to ask my questions, and I haven't had. I, I know, but you can go back to it, but that's not what we submitted. Okay. Well, there again, you know, that's where we get in trouble about not having this information really prior to the board meeting. Because something I removed you didn't like? Well, I don't understand. I'm trying to do my job. I mean, really, I'm trying to do my job and understand why don't you want me to approve $287 million that was put on the consent agenda, okay, and was removed later. Now, $287 million puts our budget up over a billion dollars, right? Am I correct? Now, I'm supposed to sit here and go, no big deal. No. I'm not. I'm supposed to sit here and say, I didn't look at it. No, nobody's saying that. So, I, I don't understand why your people are like, this is a lot of money. This is a lot of things that we put out here that parents have had zero input and zero knowledge, really. I know that we've talked to the community. The community is not all these parents, the 70 some a thousand parents in the district. And you, you're just stating that you're going to do a, a data warehouse, and that the data warehouse is going to affect the children's at, um, data, which there again, I was on the phone for an extended period of time about a father that says Google is tracking every move for every project. Now, whether it's true or not, whether Google using their apps and stuff track our children or not, I don't know. I know the parents are very concerned about it. Um, I'm also, you know, when we're talking about professional development, I was a supporter of professional development, at the, but now I think we've flipped from one level of not enough to doing too much professional development. I'd like, we, we approved in, before COVID, $3 million worth of professional development for math and some things, I voted it down. Do we have any accountability as to whether that ever got done, whether it was successful, was it anything? I mean, we never were doing all these professional development things, and there's no accountability for it. I'm just saying. I mean, we, we approved that $3 million just in back, and we were said somehow we were going to do it was a math. I could go back and figure it out. What do you mean no accountability? I'm, I mean, there's no, what we have no way to tell that since, all right, we did this math um, professional development. There's nothing there that says after these teachers took this professional development that we saw a gain in this math for anybody. That's not true. We have well, then I'm not seeing it. But we have extensive reports. Well, I'm not seeing so. And I have asked several times about the testing, and I would also like to see some information if we're spending millions of dollars on professional development. This board should be asking for some information on where we're seeing the success of that professional development. And that, that's me because I'm seeing reduced face-to-face -face instruction, more testing, and more professional development. That's what I'm seeing. Now, I'm fine with that if it's resulting in something, but I've got nothing to go on as to whether we're, we're gaining on this and now COVID's a hard thing to deal with and I understand that but if we're moving forward there's got to be some accountability if we're doing all this professional development that says it's like having the baseline we had before some kind of baseline and it says okay we've spent 70 million dollars on professional development where where's where's our success story where are how are we going to know our success story um okay so, I mean, I've been for it, but I'm not 100% for it. And when you were talking about um, access points, if your network infrastructure in your building cannot support it, it doesn't matter. Or if your trunk going up to, if your applications have to go all the way up the main trunk to a satellite across the major network, your access points aren't going to work for you. Right. So just having access points is not going to help you if you do not have the network capacity in the building along with the access the broadband need to push all that data up the broadband is what's going to slow you down so i'm just going to let you know that um any 
anything else that I had. Okay, so again, I want to know that if I approve this right now, I'm approving all of this on a very little limited information. Is that true? So the budget amendment is includes this along with other funds at the, at the level that is required for board approval of the budget. Say that to me one more time. The budget amendment includes this along with all the other funds that are included in it at the budget level that is required for board approval. Okay. That's reflected on the budget amendment. So if it's if I approve it, we now have increased our budget to over a billion dollars. And when will I be notified or have information provided to me as to whether any of this happens or am I ever going to be asked to approve anything? So we will follow all board policies to bring requests for approval when needed to the board. So you if it's a hundred and if it's a service and it's more than 150 at this point, you have to bring it to me. Right. If it's a change order at this point, you have to bring it to me over yes. of 100 or more. Yes. If, um, okay. All right. Well, I personally believe that the public should have more time to understand what we're doing and whether it is, even I should have more time since we obviously didn't have what's on our list here. But anyway, um, I'm good. Speaking to professional development real quick, as somebody who has to have continuing ongoing education to maintain a licensure, is something we call the Red Queen phenomenon. Run, run as fast as you can just to stay where you are. That is the base, bare minimum for continuing education, and that takes Year, you know, uh, every nurse in state is going to laugh at me right now, but it requires, I think, 20, 20 hours of continuing education for nurses every two years, um, you know, more for physicians and the higher up in licensure you go, and that is just maintaining baseline status. And it seems to me that that is what all we are managing to do right now, and that's not a criticism, it's just an observation. And when you want to step forward, um, for example, uh, you know, working for, having worked for Wake Forest Baptist Health recently, you know, when you're trying to push past just the maintenance of what you need to continue to function in your profession and step that up to develop and truly expand what you have in your staff, that takes this variety of push because you're not only developing for one specific unit in one specific spot in one specific profession. This has to be taken as a global thing because everything has to move together. All the teachers for all the subjects and all the capacities and it takes not only a ridiculous amount of money and if you look at the budget for Wake for their professional development, your eyes will pop, uh, but it also takes coordination for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And I mean, I am not gonna lie, I absolutely love this idea of uh, a development and education center because speaking from someone who's worked in different capacities in different hospitals and walked into everything from a single room education center where you don't have enough room to spread elbows all the way up to you know university adjunct hospitals, it makes a difference in your recruitment and your retainment, and it makes a difference in your employee outcomes. I, I just wanted to put that out there that this variety of professional development is not something that's seen often in a public venue. And um, it was something I really appreciated when I was at Wake Forest Baptist, especially, you know, we had um, the higher levels and like our um, trauma physicians, say people like that come in and, and lecture and educate us. Um, and that is what will push your staff past the Red Queen phenomenon and into truly stepping forward and keeping them there with us. I would add that neither would you see in nursing, um, nurses being hired with no nursing background. It wouldn't right. happen like you see in teaching. So yeah, there's no such thing as a lateral entry nurse. We're going and put the IV in and, and you know, Train you know, good you luck. Know like we do in education, where we have people teaching people's kids 
with no background in education. So when we say, you know, I want to see the impact of the PD, I think we all are looking to make sure it's having an impact. But if we think it's going to just raise the student outcomes, some of this PD is just teaching them to teach. Unlike what Mrs. Knapper just explained, where it's helping them just to sustain their, their basic nursing license, the skills they already had as the bare minimum to work in the hospital. Thank you. Anita, Betty, then Winston. Real quick question. What's the total amount that is in question with the auditors that they have not given approval? And which auditors, ours or ESSER or the DPI or whose auditors? So we've been advised by DPI that the uh, test for compliance will come from our fiscal auditors. So that's, we're using, we're contacting our external audit firm um, for that. It's the 35 million for the uh, PD center and it's the seven and a half million for the pre-K. Okay, thank you. Betty? Well, I want to go on record saying that I think this is a great plan. Um, in District 7, as you know, we lost three schools. And so now we have the opportunity to bring a resource center in District 7. We also had the opportunity to have a pre-K program in one school. Not saying that we would not have pre-K in other schools, but we would have a pre-K school. The raises that is desperately needed. Bonuses. The signing bonus is desperately needed. I'm not sure how much more we can ask for, and I definitely approve this program. Thank you. Winston? Yeah, I, I want to say that I think everybody should ask their questions and understand it, and I appreciate all the folks that have had input on this, but I think it's a bit incendiary to say that there's no accountability. We have layers of accountability in this district in managing complex and a wide variety of funding sources, federal, state, local, grant dollars, settlement fees, et cetera. And to indicate that that accountability is, is non-existent is to me incendiary and inappropriate, but you have a right to say it. And I'm gonna say we have a lot of accountability in this district. And that we have, we are a part-time board of directors with a variety of experiences. Not one human up here on the dais has managed a billion dollar entity. Only one, Dr. Sharon Contreras. And she's managed, you've not managed a billion dollar entity. You oh. haven't done it. You well, could be a part of one. I've, I've managed a project. You could be a years. part of one, but you haven't done it, and nobody up here has done it consistently with the number of employees and the level of complexity. It is our job to hire a CEO, and then that CEO hires an extraordinary team of people that we also have to vote on and endorse who have been here who are doing this work, who have to abide by laws and processes, and they have deep integrity, and they ensure accountability in the system. So to imply that there is no accountability because somehow the details at, at a certain moment is what you don't have to me is, is um, problematic. So I want to say I do believe we have good systems accountability. I do believe that um, we have excellent leadership to manage this. Our job is to provide oversight, that our job is to work within the law and do the things that Board of um, Educations are or the way that's outlined in statutes in North Carolina, which is very clear. And um, I see the CFO and, the, and uh, this whole staff under the leadership of our superintendent bringing those things to us in an environment that is increasingly complex and where you are having to manage multiple things. And I am deeply grateful for it. And I do think I'm doing my job and I may do it differently than you do. So I, I just want to say that really clearly. There are so many layers of accountability with this kind of funding. And, and, and we have met the bar. 
and we are, and we, I trust we will continue to meet the bar. And I will also do my job to make sure I'm not just relying on trust, that I'm also doing my job as I should. Thank you. Thank you, Winston. And I would add, I, I <clears throat> just ditto what you said. Deborah. I appreciate so much the way that you laid that out and articulated how developmental professional development is and all of the complexity we are asking people to address deeply rooted structural issues. Many of them are non-academic and uh, people doing the best they can to get a lot of information in a short amount of time. And it is so unrealistic to think that we would see some concrete numbers or tangible results after a small investment, and even this big investment is an incredibly small investment spread so thin across this district with the time that our, um, you know, school-based staff, our district staff um, need to do the jobs that they're currently doing. When we were in person, I remember the presentations that gave us um, the outcomes, we did have outcomes around a lot of the initiatives and they were very exciting. They were very interesting. I can't even, um, you know, it's been so long because we've been out of here, but I remember the sort of co-teaching and the math and, um, you know, the, <coughs> um, the, the um, uh, initiative that was very promising during the pandemic. Um, Dr. Sarfo, Asai Sarfo, um, gave us extensive presentations, letting us know what was happening where our students were. You know, my, my colleague says something. She's an ordained minister that does work with me. And she says, you know, she uses scripture to talk about data. She says, there's a scripture that said, love covers a multitude of sins. Well, so does aggregated data. And I think that it is incredibly important because we don't have reliable data sources. I mean, Target knows a lot more about your child than Guilford County Schools does because Target, these cookies, these algorithms, they do. I mean, there's a funny story about a man didn't know his child was involved in some of the things that she was involved in because of the things she purchased. <laughs> And so and when you run your debit card and all of that, and so with technology and with access and with TikTok and everything, um, you know, um, people have a lot more to worry about than the school system trying to get data to let us know in a very granular way what is happening to students. And so, um, so I, I just want to say that we've had this since May the 12th. The majority of this has not changed. We have had ample opportunity to talk to people. The county commissioners, we went over this when we met with them. They had this information to talk to their constituents. That's our job. When we went through our own board development, we are supposed to come to board meetings prepared to vote. We are supposed to ask questions in between board meetings. We are supposed to disseminate information to any of our constituents that have concerns and questions. Now, are there going to be some last minute changes? I hope so. I hope we're not so rigid that what we said in May hasn't changed a bit after the board has had conversations with the superintendent, after the su superintendent has talked to other superintendents, after we've had conversations with the county commissioners and staff. I hope that, the, that we realize that there are things that we can come back and then make a, a different decision on. So um, I agree with you, Winston. I think, it's, I think it's misleading and I think it's unfortunate to put that kind of a spin on any of the, the, the challenges or questions people have about these reports. And so I appreciate the staff Madam and Chair. Dr. Contreras. Yeah. Uh, hold on just a minute, Diane. I'm sorry. I kept checking my, um, my, my text message to see if, and I just see one from Lisa now, but I did check it before I started talking. So I'll call in you in just a minute. Um, but anyway, I, I appreciate this and I, I hope that we continue to evolve and, and make good decisions based on good information. So thank you, Diane. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we did. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, my concern here is, is that what you said, Madam Chair, we, uh, the superintendent, we laid out goals and KPIs, and the superintendent and her staff have been very deliberate, uh, along with uh, Dr. Sofa, uh to tell us where progress has been made. Even when the superintendent suggested either whether it was professional development for, uh, or the leadership, um, uh, the leadership class for principals or uh, trying to get more training to lateral entry teachers. Uh, you know, when, when she proposed that we need to get uh, more eighth graders taking math one, the very next year we saw it, change how we accept kids into the AP programs. We saw children achieving who 
um, when the superintendent told us that if we uh, allowed um, due process, that we would see different outcomes uh, as far as discipline and how children are treated and their parents as far as going to school. All of these things are documented. Now, I don't know if people got pandemic fog or what, but, but you, you, you gotta, I mean, all of that data is there. Uh, you know, when the superintendent tweaked the KPIs for third grade uh, reading scores for African-American males to try to get more in, uh, to, to, to concentrate on the weakest link, we started to see some progress and then the pandemic happened. Okay, now we're trying to reset. We're trying to come out of this pandemic. We're trying to recover from 14 months of, of, of virtual uh, and remote and uh, the whole gamut of trying to still educate children without somebody dying. So it makes sense for us to invest this money since we have the opportunity. Because this is a once, uh, you know, kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, this money would not have been available if there had not been the pandemic. Not that I'm happy there was a pandemic, but we need to take full advantage of however we can plug whatever we can plug for the benefit of children from pre-K all the way through past graduation from high school. And when folks sit and act like they mad because they don't feel like they're getting the information, I don't understand why, because the superintendent sends out her board uh, notices to us. I think she her phone number is uh, connected to each one of us so that we can pick it up and call her if we want to know something. So, you know, this, 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 this notion that we're hiding something from the public. We're one of the most open agencies as far as giving information out. And you can ask Dr. Cardis because she probably spends, stays up 20 out of 24 hours to make sure that information gets out, whether it's regardless of who asked for it, even when it's redundant. So we need to, you know, move forward. We each have our pieces. I'm, I can't support the training center at the location that's suggested, but the rest of it, I can so, you know, Madam Chair, whenever everybody's finished talking, I want to move this item. So All right, moved. well, that's been moved in. Angie, if the training center, um, if the money in question that the auditors have to prove is removed, what would that, what would the bottom line be on this amendment? <clears throat> So the amendment would still be for the same amount. We would just rebudget, repurpose those dollars on a different budget line. So, I mean, with the total ESSER funds is not changing. Okay. So I it's understand how, it's that, how that we're but, spending it. So another line would increase. But would we, so you're asking us to budget the money for a project that may not happen. Um, what so, would the adjusted yeah. figure be if it, if we were to delay voting on that part until the auditors have approved it? So it would be reduced by the $35 million, um, for the, so it would bring the... Would it be $42.5 million thereabouts? If you wanted to take the $7.5 million off as well. They haven't approved that? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> We have a motion on the floor. Yeah. We do. We do? Yeah. Diane made it. Substitute Paris. motion that we approve it less the $42.5 million that is still subject to um, audit approval. So we probably need to have a motion that dispels out specifically, I think, what that Substitute amount is. Uh, $42.5 million less. Linda seconded the substitute motion. So what is the amount, Angie? Um, let me get it just a second. Yeah, so yeah. we're trying to get the amount of what it would be minus that. The federal federal grants program, our federal grants fund uh, budget amendment 
would be $244,908,443. Yep, please vote electronically. Diane, I'll get to you in just a minute. Yes, we're right. voting on the substitute motion. Everyone's clear on this substitute motion. I don't need to get it up on the screen. Or sure, yes. put it up. Okay, then I need just one moment. Okay. <laughs> Anita, you can restate it while you're while Lisa's getting it up there. Because yeah. with, the, with the amount, we know what it is, but just so that everybody's clear. Because turn your uh, mic on, Anita. I just turned it off. Um, the 307-571-999 less, um, 42 and a half million. Okay. No, no, that the three, the whole 307 was not included in the budget. So the two. Amendment. So it's 287 But it's on this sheet. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. As, as the superintendent indicated, the first ESRA money that was approved last year is included in that first year column. So it would be. The 287, whatever it was, I can't find it right it's now. Two, it's 287, 408, 443, less 42 and a half. Yes, okay. Yeah. So the new amount would be 244,908,443 dollars. Four four three. Madam Chair. Yes, Diane. I have. We haven't voted yet. Do you have a question? I'm not opposed to the training center, so I, I'm not, you know, wanting necessarily to pull the money out. I just have an objection, and the superintendent and I have discussed this about the location. It could go somewhere else in district in in uh, district two, but just not at that location. And uh, you know, I don't really want to just you know say what the reasons are, but the superintendent knows what my reasons are. So I don't want to get rid of the training center, just well, that location. Well, we're at a vote now, Diane. So I'll get to you in just a minute. Well, that's not right. Oh, Diane, what's your vote? No. So that motion fails by a vote of. I don't know, Diane. Uh, oh, Diane's is. I, I pressed too quickly. Uh, my apologies. So it'd be seven, seven to one. To, yeah. All right, so we're now back at the original motion, and that is approving um, the 2020-2021 budget amendment transfers report as it's submitted. So please vote electronically as soon as um, Lisa has a chance to clear it. Linda hasn't voted yet. You voted on that. Oh, I'm sorry. That's because I'm laying in this one. Undo the pat. Can you take pats off, Lisa? Um, that's a great question. I, I have not learned how. I haven't learned how to do that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> can you un? Can you undo it? I can. Hit the clear zero. everyone's. Hit the zero. No. Nope. Did you hit the zero? Yes, I did. It didn't work. Just clear all and start all. Yes. There you go. I do apologize. We'll have to start over. That's okay. That's fine. I'll we'll get it okay. right this time. Start over. Right Diane, how do you vote? I vote yes, but I want it in the minutes that I object to <laughs> it, it is, Diane. location it, it is. for the training center. We recorded that from the a minute ago. Okay, I just want okay, can I not ask to make sure that it is yes, recorded, Madam Chair? Yes, ma'am. It will be in the Thank minutes. Thank you. That passes by a vote of six to two. 
Thank you. We're now at item C, 2021-2022 interim budget resolution. Is there a motion? I move to accept the resolution. Is there a second? Second. Um, any discussion, Anita? Can I ask that Angie read it for us? Sure. sure. I think she has some additional information. Sure, yeah, so before I read it, I would like to talk, um, let you know that the county uh, commissioners did pass their budget this evening at their meeting. Um, if you will recall, the county manager recommended um, an increase of $12.5 million in our operating budget and an increase of um, 900000 to our in our capital budget to bring it up to $4 million. Um, Tonight, the, the county commissioners approved a budget that allocated an additional three and a half million above what the county manager's um, recommendation was for um, operating, bringing the, the total allocation. Um, wait a minute, I'm, I'm trying to read what, the, what was in the actual budget. Um, increase the operating budget allocation to the Guilford County Schools by three and a half million for a total operating and capital allocation of. $229,610,398. So of that, $4 million is capital. $225,610,398 will be operating. Um, the allocation is intended to be used among other uses to cover increases in compensation for locally paid positions. If you'll recall, part of what we asked them for was for increases to match the state required increases for our locally funded positions um, to increase funding for teacher supplements by $8 million. That's exciting to me, so I said it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and allow for a $15 minimum pay rate for school nutrition workers. hate this thing for a total operating increase not total operating but operating increase 16 million so we ended up with close to 17 million? 17 point 16 point nine million yeah, yeah. okay we, yeah the total increase. 18, mm -hmm. so. all right thank you all right please vote Oh, I'm sorry. Did you want me to read? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, um, because we didn't know what those amounts were, typically we include those in our budget resolution, our interim budget resolution, because a lot of times we do know what the county funding is going to be, but because we didn't this year, um, we are asking the uh, Board of Education to approve an inter uh, the 21-22 interim budget resolution as a resolution authorizing interim, interim appropriation and disbursements reside by the Guilford County Board of Education that pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 115C-434 interim budget, the Guilford County Board of Education hereby authorizes the disbursements of such amounts as may be necessary to pay salaries and wages of employees of Guilford County Schools, principal and interest of indebtedness and all other usual ordinary expenses that may come due and payable during the interval between the beginning of the 21-22 fiscal year and the adoption of the budget resolution for that year. Such expenditures to be chargeable to the proper budget funds hereafter adopted for the fiscal year. And the board hereby appropriates from the proper funds such amounts as may be necessary for the disbursements authorized by this resolution until such time as the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction releases the 21-22 fund, state fund initial allotments and federal planning allotments and the Guilford County Board of County Commissioners have approved the 21-22 appropriations for the local current expense fund and capital outlay fund. Administration recommends approval of this interim budget resolution in accordance with North Carolina General Statute 115C-434. Thank you, Lisa. You'll activate our panel so we can vote. Oh shoot! I did it again. I think it, just <laughs> Linda, see if you can hold the hold this hold the zero down. I think if you hold the the O down for a while, it might. Uh, let's see. I like Pat. Oh, Lisa has to do it. She has to clear it. Sorry. I thought I cleared it a minute ago, but it might not have been me. <laughs> I'm a troubleshooter. <laughs> All right, and Diane? Yes. 
Thank you. All right. Well, that passes unanimously. All right. Well, congratulations and great. All right. We are now at item D, and it's a motion to reconsider a vote on policy DC. Ms. Jenkins? I would like to make a motion to approve the policy DC budgeting and physical management. I'll second. Board members, this is, I know, nobody's favorite subject. So that just so we go through the parliamentary procedure of how this happens. Because Ms. Jenkins voted in the majority, she can vote to reconsider. She can move to reconsider. Anyone can second. First, you're going to vote on the motion to reconsider. If that motion passes, then you're going to vote on what she wants to reconsider. But this is the motion to reconsider, not the action itself. Jill. Yes. Did we, did yeah. we approve the motion to reconsider by putting it on the agenda? No, you approved the amendment to the agenda. Okay, okay, okay. I, I real this is probably more fall raw than you should have to go under, but yeah. because we're under Robert's rules, I just figured nope, you no might problem. as well dot the I's and cross the T's. Okay, okay. Deborah. Just before we vote real quick, um, are we considering it the way it is or with yes. edits? No. Nope. So well, exactly. all you're doing is reconsidering the subject, mm -hmm. and I can tell you in practice, there are board members who will vote to reconsider anything. They may not vote for it, but they are willing to reconsider it if there's some reason to do it. So a vote to reconsider doesn't lock you into voting for or against anything. It just allows someone who's had second thoughts about something they've done to explain to you why and give them a chance to reconsider their vote. All right, so everyone vote on the motion to reconsider the vote. Diane? Yes. It passes by a vote of seven to one. Ms. Jenkins? Move the item. Is there a second? I think you should be clear on what move the item means because so the item it's not is that on the, the agenda. The so previous I motion that, and you can say what it was, but it's exactly yeah. as it was. It has to be exactly as it was in the May 10th meeting. Right. So Betty, do you want to read what the motion was or what policy DC is that, that um, Diane yeah, I don't, is moving? I just don't think that was sufficient. I, I agree, Jill. Thank you. Lisa, do you have it? Thank you. It's in the minute. You want me to? It's in the minute. I don't think it's in. Oh, that's right, not these it was electronically. Minutes. That's right. We didn't have to vote on minutes in this meeting. Lisa has a Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the recommendation from the last meeting was to approve, adopt revised policy DC budgeting and fiscal management as presented. Have I misunderstood what you were asking for? No. no. All right, so that's uh, we have a motion and a second. Will you um, activate our panel so that we can vote? It's the exact same thing. Diane? Yes. It passes by a vote of five to three. All right, we are now at board member comments. And um, yes, Betty. Ms. Henry, when will you have um, the mm -hmm. information for the board and for the public as a copy of the administrative regulation to the change order policies for the process? We'll, we'll be bringing that to the next policy committee meeting. Okay, thank you. Is she asking for the procedures? We don't approve those. 
we're not bringing it for approval. But we've asked for proceed to see procedures in the past, and we've been told no. So why is this one different? I've been told I couldn't see them. The change order. Oh. Yeah. Right. The, the change order uh, issue ought to be a separate freestanding policy, which I think was going to be passed at, we'll bring it. at bring it to the next in the next group policy. Yes. So I assume it will be a policy, not a procedure. All right, we're now at board member comments. Uh, Linda. I'm done. Winston. Um, I want to say I cannot believe how much work is getting done across this district with 16,000 kids registered for summer school and an amazing series of graduations, which were inspiring and logistically challenging and joyful. Um, the valedictorian and salutatorian luncheon, which several of, um, my colleagues here attended was incredibly inspiring. Um, the progress we've made over the years, and especially in comparison to other districts across the state, and expanding access to high-level courses, especially to students of color, just really increased that. Shows in that valedictorian and salutatorian luncheon, what an amazing, diverse array of brilliant, uh, inspiring, a little bit shy um, students. And um, they, it, it was just staggering. And so appreciate that even that new event got layered on this year in the midst with everything else going on. And it was, it was terrific. And, um, you know, I say the Pledge of Allegiance every time we're up here and at other events. And I'm mindful of what Benjamin Franklin said, we have a republic if we can keep it. And I think that requires a lot of dissent and it requires some arguing and it requires disagreement because we're probably not talking about the right things if we're not disagreeing some. And yet I think there are times when we get outside of what is um, productive dissent. And so I think most of the time we get back in the lane with productive dissent. And um, I hope that's where we can continue to steer the ship because the kids expect that of us, they deserve that of us, and we can model that for them really critically. So um, I appreciate debate and disagreement, and I appreciate, um, especially when we try and get that into the lane of respect, even if it's vigorous disagreement. Um, Dean, I appreciate how you heard the cats up here <laughs> and behind the scenes, and I deeply appreciate the leadership of the superintendent under um, what I think are extraordinarily difficult circumstances. And um, there, there have been social media posts. I, I, if anybody follows me on social media, it's pretty light on my end usually. But I have friends who shared some things with me, and I've seen some very disturbing um, activity on social media that very quickly escalates from misinformation about what we're discussing in a board meeting to accusing the superintendent of wanting to cancel America, set up one party rule under a Marxist banner, and to do that in about 90 seconds flat in a video. And I just wanna to say to folks, that is vitriol that is so outside the lane of productive dissent. It's destructive, it's destructive for kids, it's destructive for our community, and it is um, not something that our CEO should have to endure. Um, and so uh, we're going to appreciate the comments you made, Madam Chair, about what we will do to ensure um, that we keep inside the lanes of what's productive and legal and that we pursue every appropriate action when um, we're being pulled outside that lane or when things are happening outside that lane that threaten the staff and um, that ultimately then threaten children. So um, 
But I'll also just say it has been a joy to watch Marcus Gauss <laughs> go <agent>. crazy <laughs> across the globe. My brother lives in Japan, and I think it was yesterday, or I can't remember the week. It's been a week. You know, sent me the biggest morning show in Japan was airing Marcus Gauss <laughs> singing to the Andrews grads, and it was beautiful. And uh, he's a teacher there and, and was inspired. So um, just was great. So thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, I also wanted to say that thank you, Chair, for your remarks in regard to our responsibility and supporting um, the only employee that we have um, and ensuring that um, she is safe and that we will do everything um, within our power to make sure that she is. I'm grateful that I was <laughs> invited by Kay Cashin to attend the Guilford County Behavioral Health Crisis Center's uh, ribbon cutting. Um, I appreciate her uh, pulling me aside and saying, you need to be there. So whenever she says you need to be somewhere, I behoove you to make sure you are there. And I do appreciate that. It's a great opportunity um, for the Guilford County um, community to see our students and families able to get um, that support that they need um, when in crisis. Um, this is a great investment um, for Guilford County. I also want to say thank you, uh, Dr. Contreras, for putting together the valedictorian and salutatorian luncheon. Um, it was a great event. You know, that's the investment. That's the accountability. That's the outcomes that, you know, we were able to witness um, in supporting those students. It was all the students, the graduations that we attend, that's what we see. We see the investments coming to fruition. Um, and I'm just grateful. We see it in the district. This is a great district to be a part of. Um, and we are going forward. I'm looking for this district to continue to do great things. Um, on the federal level, um, Murphy, Presley, Warren, Smith, Omar Bowman introduced legislation to end the criminalization of students and invest in counselors, safer environment for kids. The CNC um, Act has uh, been presented to Congress today. So I hope that is something um, that they, we can all support the hiring of all those health professionals um, that we need in our schools to support our students. I also want to say congratulations um, in reading um, the report, all the scholarships and grants. This is the work. This is the outcome. Andrews, $4 million to students, $5 million to Dudley. Um, in, NCA and T, eleven million dollars in scholarships, fourteen million dollars in Northwest at Northwest Guilford High School, sixteen million um, coming out of uh, Smith High School. This is what we are investing in in our students. We see it happening, and we must continue that momentum. Um, I was happy to see Nora um, turn stereotypes upside down. Uh, yes, you're in here. I'll make sure I get my uh, autograph copy um, this afternoon. Thank you, Nora. Um, we celebrate our own. These are the great things um, that she's doing and keeping Guilford County on a national um, map. I want to say thank you as a parent for my summer learning opportunity uh, catalog with the information. I was so excited when I saw this. I was like, oh, my God, look at this. <laughs> I know what's going on. I see all these options for my son, you know, for students and all the great work that the district is doing. This means a lot to families. Um, this is accountability. Thank you so much um, for producing that, Guilford County. We are doing great things in this district, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Well, I would ditto um, my colleagues where it's concerning the ribbon cutting for the mental health and also the program which we attended on last Saturday. Also, um, parents, I thank you very much for allowing your child, our students, to participate in the summer learning opportunities. Thank you to Bessemer Elementary School along with Dudley High School for hosting the COVID-19 vaccine clinic. We definitely appreciate you. Happy Father's Day to all the male role models, all the dads, all the fathers, and all the father figures. Please enjoy.
some activity. There are so many activities going on this weekend for Juneteenth. Please, please, please check some of those activities out. I know you will have an awesome time. Thank you to all the county commissioners. We thank you for our students. You have definitely made an impact on the lives of students and the lives of staff, and we appreciate that. Ms. Henry, I thank you very much for allowing me to have some time with you because my vote at the last <coughs> meeting was no, and that was because I was not equipped with all the information. The part about, uh, well, it was a part that I didn't quite understand, and Ms. Henry helped me with that, and I thank you very much. Thank Enjoy you. your afternoon. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, first off, I would like to say um, there again, congratulations to our valedictorians and salutatorians from this weekend's luncheon. It was absolutely gorgeous. And hearing all of these uh, high school graduates stand up and rattle off the amazing list of colleges they've been accepted to, uh, you know, everything from right here at UNCG all the way up to Ivy League was absolutely amazing. The sheer volume of them going into some variety of engineering, and we even had one uh, young lady focused on it, specifically on diabetics, and I'm going, ooh, I, I, somebody keep me away from this kid because I'll be here talking to her all night. Um, and it was, I, I wish that it could have been heard by more because you can s really get a grip on what our high school graduates are achieving. When you hear them say from their own mouth, this is where I've, this is what I've done in the past four years, and this is what I'm heading for now. It really was enough to really, you know, wow me. And I wasn't expecting that, I'll be honest. <laughs> not, that, not trying to sell you of our grad short. Um, but it was amazing. It genuinely was. The only other thing I'll say is this. Um, the last meeting, if you were watching, you would have heard in my closing comments a, a little... Um, focus on um you know kind of the togetherness of humanity and how we are all interdependent on each other and my advice to those graduates to never forget that that the support systems are there so a little reminder i grew up in the backwoods y'all um you know there, there are people who used to be bears on the back porch okay um and one thing that was very popular is if you didn't want to burden a tree they would smoke it out right? It lights something up underneath that bird's nest and try and get them to go away. The problem is we lived in a forest and you never know which way the wind was going to blow. And sometimes nothing happened because you couldn't even get the fire lit in the first place. Sometimes the birds would leave and sometimes they burn the place down. So when you look to smoke something out that you think is a problem, whether it be or not, be aware of the way that the wind can take it away from you because you never know what, what's gonna burn down next. Be cautious of your words, please. Thank you. Ms. Sharp. Um, I'm not sure where I wanna <clears throat> start here. One of the things, I have several things that I would like for the board to consider at the next meeting, not tonight. I don't know what's appropriate anymore, so I'm gonna do it in my closing comments. Um, one thing is the summer feeding sites. If you'll plot those out on a map, and take a look at them, you will see huge areas of this county where there is no summer feeding site. And I would like to the staff to consider remedying that situation. Um, I would like for us also to get back into the KPI updates. We've had testing. I think we need to take a look at them and see just how much learning loss we have experienced uh, and then we, we as a board will understand more how to remedy that. Uh, I have asked Lisa to read a motion for March of 2020. I meant to bring it, I meant to read it myself, but it's on my desk. So I've asked her if she would read the motion. <clears throat> motion was made by Winston McGregor, seconded by Pat Tillman, sorry that the board authorize the superintendent to temporarily waive board policies as necessary to implement appropriate response measures regarding potential risks and legal actions associated with COVID-19 
with the understanding that the superintendent will keep the board informed on any such action. And I think she has done that um, as far as keeping us informed. Uh, we talked earlier about the crisis and we are still in a crisis, but the emergency aspect of that has passed. So at the next board meeting, the July board meeting, I would like uh, the revocation of that motion on the agenda for discussion. Um, would also like to say a happy 96th birthday to my mother-in-law, Sarah Sharp. She'll be celebrating that tomorrow. Thank you, Diane. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, first, I, I, I feel like I have to say this. When I came on the board in 2016, I asked then, could we pay classified staff $15 an hour? And I was told, wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and now it has happened. So I think that it's important for us to always remember where we started so that we can help and make it possible for others to get there. So I want to thank everybody who over the past five years has, you know, continued to hear me say we need to pay classified employees $15 an hour. And now we're there. So next, we're going to work on insurance for them. Uh, my next thing is, is, Dr. Contreras, can you tell us what the percentage of students graduating? Do you have that yet? No, we don't have graduation don't have rates yet. Oh. I'm sorry. Um, no, we don't have graduation rates yet. <clears throat> okay. Well, I, I hope that, you know, we got no, in, last year or year before last, we were one of the top in the state. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then my last uh, comment has to do with Juneteenth. Today, our president signed a uh, a bill making Juneteenth a national holiday effective immediately. And that's good. But now we need to make the Voting Rights Act uh, a permanent part of law, as well as uh, they need to pass the infrastructure. So though we may celebrate about folks having a conscience about Juneteenth, we still got other work that needs to be done to make this country hold again. So I hope everybody will have a good weekend. Fathers, uh, congratulations for their efforts towards their children or even those who are fathers who don't have children. And I hope everybody will find something to do on Juneteenth and particularly look at um, GCS uh, uh, Live, no, G, uh, GCL, Greensboro, City of Greensboro Live starting at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> and I just have a few things to say. Um, I want to thank the county commissioners. I appreciate Commissioner Alston and Chairman Alston and Vice Chair Carl Vina Foster for um, their desire and effort to um, build a bridge and to open up communications. Um, the superintendent, myself, um, Winston, Jill, Nora, <laughs> um, Angie, of course, um, and, and Ms. Jenkins was there in the audience, um, but she did an excellent job presenting the budget, the ESSER funding, the explanation and answering questions. And I think that clarity had something to do with the support that we received from the county commissioners tonight. And so um, this feels like a, um, a, a, a great beginning um, to begin working very closely with the county because as Commissioner Alston said, we're, we're the same county. We are the same county and everyone is impacted by the decisions that are made across the county. I also wanna see how disappointed I am in a post made by the North Carolina State Superintendent, Catherine Truitt. This is the North Carolina State Superintendent for the North Carolina State Education System. And I know how restrictive it is sitting in this seat because there are things I would say if I wasn't sitting here, because I'd be an independent board member and not someone responsible for being equitable and fair and um, not exploiting the seat. And it has been very difficult. I have really not chosen to be here um, and appreciate everyone's support. 
Um, but I have expectations that people who are in positions of leadership have to rise above their own personality and agenda. But Superintendent Catherine Truitt said today that she will continue to do everything she can to eradicate the teaching of critical race theory and the North Carolina Republicans are united behind this. And, um, you know, it's absurd because we haven't even had a discussion, you know, to critically analyze the impact of race in our history as we are celebrating Juneteenth this weekend that acknowledges the elimination of slavery. But I just want to talk about it. it didn't just end slavery. We're talking about two and a half centuries of not only denying people access to opportunities, creating a, a race arrangement, really, because white people, poor and working class white people, were a problem to the land-owning gentry. They were indentured servants, they were exploited, they were abused, they were misled, and they found solidarity with kidnapped and enslaved Africans and indigenous people, and that was a problem to, uh, to the, the colonial leaders in Virginia. So they had to figure out what to do with poor and working class white people. So they created this all class racial identity that they could be a part of. So we didn't just spend 246 years oppressing people. We spent 246 years hoodwinking and misleading other people as well. And that I believe accounts for the fact that we have twice as many, if not more poor, working class white people on welfare in the United States that a lot of wealthy people don't give two cents about. I think we also spent two and a half centuries building a nation to the exclusion of everyone else. So we spent 62% of our experience in the United States under that arrangement. And then another hundred years of Jim Crow that says, all right, you're a citizen, you're not enslaved, but you don't have any rights. You couldn't go to school in Guilford County. <laughs> You couldn't live in a lot of the neighborhoods in this county and in this city. You couldn't be buried in cemeteries. You couldn't eat at Woolworths. You couldn't stay in hotels. You couldn't watch the movies in theaters. And then there were state sanctioned laws like the Social Security Act that said if you're a domestic worker or an agricultural worker, you can't participate. That was 1935, the year my dad was born. So this isn't something that happened in 1942. As the American Bar Association said, that this is not a bygone relic of the past. And I am stunned that there is not an inquiry or a desire to engage in critical examination of the thing people are going around here trying to ban. We say we want our children to be critical thinkers that we wanted them to be inquisitive, to be curious, to question. Mm -hmm. And what we are saying here is don't do that. So um, happy Juneteenth. And Dr. Contreras, um, you know, uh, we have our days, but it is truly an honor to, to serve with you um, because I know that you really do care about children. And I am sorry what is happening to you and um, I'll do everything in my position, in my role as a community member uh, here in this city um, to be, um, to stand side by side with you um, and to, um, to make sure that um, you know and that the public knows you are not alone. So thank you for everything that you do. And um, with that said, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, staff. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, public.